The next speaker that uh, was referenced earlier by the center director is the historian here at Dryden. It is Christian Geltzer, excuse me, yeah. Uh, let me introduce Christian Geltzer, thank you. Sweat wings. This was a nasty airplane to fly. A nasty airplane to fly. Did they change the wings? Uh, they put wing fences on it to try and control the airflow. Did that help? Not a chance. Did they keep flying it? You bet. X-3, Air Force airplane. Beautiful looking airplane, isn't it? Oh, it looks like it came from outer space. <laughs> stinker. Defines the word stinker. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's a lousy airplane. You don't know what inertial coupling is. Inertial coupling kills. Kills, kills, kills. Beautiful airplane. This, this is the only, they built two, only one flew. And if you go to the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, you'll see this airplane. It still survives, extraordinarily enough. Um, beautiful looking airplane. The only reason it survives was the airplane, the engines they designed with this airplane uh, didn't uh, show up. So they had to make do with what they had. And that's why uh, the pilot lived and the airplane survived. This is proof that a failure of an airplane, or a failure in general, can in fact be a plus. Because what this airplane ended up doing was proving that a theory somebody had back in Langley about something called inertial coupling was in fact not a theory. He wrote a theory about it in 1948. And in 1956, lo and behold, the guy who was flying the airplane discovered this thing, nearly killed him. Um, and it turned out to be true. What happened concurrently was that the Air Force introduced the F-100A uh, about two months beforehand into production, into, I'm sorry, into frontline service. And within the span of about six weeks, had lost six pilots and six airplanes because of inertial coupling, but it had no idea what it was. This airplane, however, explained what it was. And the NACA knew, as a result of the theory and flying this airplane, what the problem was, and could then go to the Air Force down the line and down the ramp and say, Ahem, we can solve your problem for you. Give us an airplane, we'll figure it out, we'll show you how to solve it, we'll show you what to do, and you can put that airplane back into service with some modifications, so. X-5, I talked about this airplane earlier. This is largely a German design of the um, P-1101. This is, in fact, uh, multiple images overlaid. The difference being that the original German airplane, you had to park the airplane and move the wings, whereas this airplane, you could actually pivot the wings in flight. This is the first airplane whose wings, you could change the angle of incidence in flight. This was not an easy airplane to fly, not a happy airplane to fly, but again, a research airplane. Typically, the Air Force would commission the airplane, pay for it, fly it, um, get rid of it pretty quickly, send it down the flight line and the NACA would then operate it and gather research data and then share that data extensively, so. Granddaddy of all research aircraft around here, the biggest one in terms of projects, the most famous and certainly the most productive was the X-15. I think I have a couple of pictures of this. Um, this airplane, another rocket plane, uh, the, the fastest rocket plane of all time, uh, a single seat rocket plane, rocket planes you don't take off on the ground, you carry up into the air with a mothership and you drop, otherwise you're wasting all of your fuel. Um, so that's what you did. You loaded this airplane up with the fuel, you stuck a pilot in it, you took off. In this case here under B-52, if you drive out Northgate, you'll see the that one of the two B-52s that carried this airplane, the, the X-15, there were three of these. Uh, uh, empty this airplane weighed seven tons, made of Inconel X. Uh, fully loaded, this airplane came in at about, I'm doing my numbers here, uh, at about 16 tons. Fully loaded, liquid fuel. 
plane would climb with the pilot in it after it took off from Edwards for about an hour and a half heading east, you have to use your geography here, east over Nevada, right? Turn around toward, e at a eastern Nevada, it would turn around and point its nose back toward Edward, at Edwards, and if everything was right, they would release the X-15, at <coughs> which point the pilot would light the rocket motor. Typically in 90 seconds, he'd be out of fuel. That's eight tons of fuel out the back end of that airplane in 90 seconds, no more than two minutes. Now, for comparative purposes, I mean, I'm impressed. For comparative purposes, that's a bucket of spit <laughs> compared to a shuttle. <laughs> That is nothing compared to the shuttle. A shuttle goes through fuel at the rate of 20 tons or seven tons in some cases a second. So this is a piker by comparison. But back then, I mean, this airplane was designed in the 50s and began flying in 59. This was some serious get up and go. It flew for nine years. There were 12 men who flew this airplane. Eight of them earned astronaut wings flying this airplane. Mm. This became the world's first space plane long before we had the shuttle. Long before we had the shuttle, this airplane went into space, came back and landed here on the lake bed. We're not that serious. <laughs> I mean, really, we're not that serious. <laughs> Space, in addition to the um, X-15, has always been part of Dryden. Research and space have always been part of Dryden. This is the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle. Um, this was designed to teach the astronauts how to land on the moon. It's not an easy thing to do in 1962. There are no full motion simulators you can sit at and operate in 1962 like there are today. So how do you prepare an astronaut? Kennedy's made his speech, we're gonna send somebody to the moon and back, back, right? They gotta come back, we're not gonna send them and go splat and be satisfied, they've gotta come back. You've gotta train them to land on the moon and come back. How do you do that? The moon has one sixth of the gravity and no atmosphere. How do you prepare somebody for that? This is what you train them in. It's got, <coughs> three analog computers, analog mm -hmm. computers. Get out your soldering gun or soldering iron and rewire the computer if you need to. Those three computers are redundancy. They're not, you know, we're gonna boost the capacity. They're meant for redundancy because <coughs> that jet engine shakes the, you know, what out of the machine as it flies. Um, and an ejection seat. Um, and later on, I think today or tomorrow, you'll have a chance to see one of the two remaining. They built five of these. You'll see one of the two remaining Friday. vehicles. <coughs> Friday, so I have to go back on Friday and I'll show you one of the two remaining ones. Here it is in flight, early version of it in flight over South Base. A second space vehicle, doesn't look like a space vehicle, trust me. You'll see this one too on Friday if you come back. I'm whetting your appetite, it's called a lifting body. Has no wings, doesn't look like it generates any lift whatsoever. The concept is simple. Normally you come back in a capsule, at least that's the theory, right? You come back in a capsule, there's this flat back end that wears away and it absorbs the heat. A couple of engineers theorize that instead of coming back in a capsule, if you, now you have to use your imagination here, imagine this to be a pencil, nub of a pencil, right? Cut the pencil in half and what you get is this shape. Tip it over sideways. Come back into the atmosphere sideways like this, not backward like a capsule, but sideways. You generate just a scooch of lift. <coughs> that's enough. You're doing Mach 25. That's lickety split. Okay, Mach 25, you're going really fast. You can wear off some of that heat and fly. Buzz Lightyear. Fly. Mach 25, you can go a long ways. And the theory was, when they designed this thing, 
Once you enter the atmosphere, you could pick your landing site anywhere in the Western US and fly to it. Land and get out and look like any normal human being with self-respect instead of waiting in the water for a frogman to come and get you. <laughs> so they built this and they flew it. Well, they towed it behind a, my, my favorite part, they towed it behind a 63, they had to buy one government money. They had to buy a 63 Pontiac Catalina convertible with the biggest engine you could find and then take it to two race shops to prep the car so they could tow a thousand pounds at 100 miles an hour. So it worked. More space. This is the approach and landing test. Enterprise, which is now um, at the museum at the Intrepid Museum in New York, uh, was carried aloft on the back of, and I think this is 905. Is 905 the one that we still have? 911, 905, 905 I believe is the one that you're going to see um, tomorrow when it arrives. Uh, lofting, excuse me, Enterprise. Here over the, um, the uh, lake bed to validate the concept of the orbiter as a flying vehicle and its systems. So you'll see a couple of pictures, I think. Uh, let's try another one. I think, yeah, um, as it's making its approach to the lake bed, these aren't Photoshop, these are actual chase pictures of the orbiter as it's making its approach um, in real time uh, to the lake bed. Uh, 